Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, this is Redberry Wheel here, and welcome back to another one of my Civil Air Patrol videos. Now, in today's video, I'm going to talk a little bit about the experience of going to encampment as a cadet staff member, and uh, talk about a few tips and tricks that I have learned throughout the experience, just as some suggestions to either current or future cadet staff members to encampment. So, let's go ahead and get into it. Well, actually, before I get too deep into this video, I just want to say that Wings run it differently, and there is a pamphlet, 60-70, which is what I'm prim primarily drawing most of my discussion items off of, and some of the leadership techniques I have drawn from my experience when we had an encampment that was like kind of trying to fully embrace 60-70, and some, some Wings may not necessarily follow it as directly as my Wing. So, take what I am saying as you will. If you disagree with some of the stuff that I am saying, then please, I would be more than happy to discuss that with you guys in the comments. Um, it, it's, it's always a, a cool thing to be able to discuss with you guys and see what your thoughts are, what your experiences are, and I'm just giving you my take. So, I, I hope you guys can at least respect what I'm trying to, to put across, and even if we disagree, we can go about this in a positive manner to promote positive change and awesomeness within Civil Air Patrol. So let's go ahead and get back into the video. So in the cadet staff side of encampment, things are pretty super duper exciting. You get to help volunteer in any number of different positions. And wings do run the different process of selecting cadre. Um, or they have different processes selecting their cadre. However, I'm primarily going to speak from my experience with my wing. So let's let's talk about the process of from selection to the actual execution of encampment. So typically in my wing, we have done it about six months before the actual activity where we select the cadet staff. The cadet commander was selected normally nine months in advance if we could maybe sometimes eight or seven, depending on how much time the, the activity commander had to put together those plans to select the, the cadet command staff for the activity. So it's typically about six months out before the activity that we would have the cadet staff selection exercise, which we put together a very intense, exciting process that a lot of people can learn from, and even if they don't get selected, they get something out of the day. So when I was the cadet commander, we, we first looked at what kind of traits do we want our cadet staff to have. And so I was like, I want them to be a good communicator. I want them to be able to provide feedback. I want them to be familiar with 60-70 and some of the requirements that it has outlined. Uh, I also wanted them to be able to work as a team member effectively and be able to work with others. And I think we had five total activities, um, but we didn't have a physical fitness component to it because we wanted to ensure that even if someone may not have the ability to do a PT test, like if they have asthma or if they like are in a wheelchair, then they can still be equally evaluated and not have some kind of waiver and like have an unbiased score process for that. So we just wanted to make sure that there was accessibility to everything in addition to just making it a fun experience for everyone. We also didn't have a drill and ceremonies component to it, at least when I was running it, because if there is a younger cadet staff sergeant who is applying to be in a flight sergeant role, I didn't want the process to be biased against them if they weren't super familiar with leading drill and ceremonies. Some squadrons don't practice drill and ceremonies as much as others. And encampment is supposed to be a learning process. So if a cadet flight sergeant hasn't really taught drill before or like an applicant to that position, I wanted them to still feel like they had the opportunity to succeed. And just by demonstrating their skills and the knowledge of 60-70, and then we would mentor them and coach them with their flight commander to make sure that they were prepared to teach drill and ceremonies at encampment itself. I can, I can understand why some people would be like, well, we need to know how strong they are with drill and ceremonies, especially if we are making sure that 
encampment is the place to standardize drill and ceremonies throughout the wing. That's a great point. We just wanted people who may not be as experienced with drill and ceremonies not to have a huge effect to their cadre selection exercise score, just so that we could try to integrate people based off of those traits, not so much just on that drill knowledge. So I had a few cadet staff members ahead of time as part of my command team. We called them the executive cadre and they were all phase four cadets who um, there, there were three groups. We had a wing. So we had three groups and then we had an operation like on the operation side and then a support group commander. So three operations groups, which would have like flight staff underneath. And then the support side had all of the support staff on it. So if it was like dining services, public affairs, logistics, the planning and organizing team, leadership team, all of those things were in the support side and led, led by that cadet in that wing, or excuse me, in that group. So carrying on, we had each of those activities throughout the day and we assigned cadets into different groups. And how we assigned them was we had a variety of ages and grades within each group and a variety of different positions that they applied for. So when we sent out the application process, we said, okay, so include your name, include your cap ID, include your current grade, and include like your preference for your first position, your second preference, and your third preference. And then we asked the question, would you be okay with serving in a position that isn't currently listed in those preferences? And upon completing that process, if we were looking at all of the scores and someone said, I don't want to serve in a position that isn't listed here, and if all of those slots were filled, then we wouldn't necessarily have to reach out to them because they just didn't seem interested. Um, I know I would still reach out to some of them because like, we just wanted to provide people with the opportunity and they would just say no, but that's just something we would do. I would try to reach out to them and just say, hey, none of the positions that you had applied for before were necessarily available anymore. Would you be willing to serve in this position? Carrying on, so that was located at, the, the cadre selection exercise was located at a centralized location at Wing Headquarters, which is about in the middle of the state for most people. Not everyone, but for a majority of the, the wing, it wasn't too far of a drive. It was sometimes four hours for some people. Some people was 10 minutes. So it, it varies depending on where you're located. But that was a, a pretty good process, I think, because we got to evaluate different characteristics of our cadet staff. Some people like to have just an interview and the wing used to have that process, but I didn't learn anything from it personally. I experienced that process twice when I was younger, when, when it was still happening. And I would sit at wing headquarters for maybe seven, eight hours and then be given five minutes to prove my worth in a really short interview with the cadet commander, the XO, or the operations, or excuse me, the, the support side. Um, it used to be the XO, but um, the, the support side of the staff, in addition to the operations side staff on the command team, and the commandant, they all just sat there and you, they would grill you for five minutes on why do you want to serve in this position? Why do you want to serve in that position? What experience do you have that would apply to this position? And yes, it is important to get interview skills, but that is something that can be taught at the squadron level as opposed to on the wing level. And that kind of selection process takes a long time. It's, it's kind of inefficient. And by the end of the day, the interviewers were just so tired they didn't really care anymore. At least it didn't feel like they cared anymore. So at the beginning of the day, they were very excited. So that might even impact the performance of those, those people interviewing at the end of the day. So if you are at all part of the selection process for your wings and encampment, I recommend thinking of the different traits that you would want your cadet staff to portray and then coming up with activities that would be used to evaluate it and come up with behaviors that people could easily observe and then check off the box. 
So we came up with a scorecard where it would say like participants along the top and you just fill in the names for the people from that group that you assigned at the beginning and it would have a list of behaviors and it would be positive behaviors and negative behaviors. So for example, we had an activity that evaluated communication and we gave them a list of different topics and they would have to do an impromptu briefing where they would select that topic, have about a minute to prepare, and then would have to speak on that topic for four minutes. It wasn't cap related, it was just a random topic like building a sandcastle or planting a tree or baking a cake. It was just like generic things that people would know how to do. So by having that list of positive behaviors, so let's, let's say three positive and three negative. So three positive behaviors associated with communication, like effective communication skills might be introduces themselves. Um, yeah, introduces themselves, provides a summary of what they will talk about and asks for questions at the end. Okay. And then negative behaviors might be they're pacing back and forth. They don't make eye contact and they seem to use a lot of filler words. And notice when I say these different behaviors, they don't overlap. So instead of saying a positive behavior would be staying in about the same spot and not pacing versus pacing being a negative, if you're getting one point for the positive and negative one point for the other, that's something that I would call a double ding and you don't want to double ding the applicants. Because if someone conveys that positive behavior versus someone who conveys that negative behavior, instead of being just one point above, it's two points difference between those two applicants. So if you are using such a process, I highly recommend having it so that the negative and the positive behaviors don't have similar definitions, just so that people don't get that double difference between scores if they convey that positive versus negative behavior. Just a thought. So after the cadet staff selection process was completed, we put together a list of all of the participants and put in their scores into a spreadsheet and rank them by their scores. So each activity had a different percentile on how important we considered it. So like some, I think I said there was five. So one of them was worth 15%. Two of them were worth like 22.5%. And oh, I think we had a small percentage on their professionalism over email, like if they would respond to emails and use proper customs and courtesies and there was a certain grading scale we used for that, maybe, like if they were responsive to communications and stuff and turning in things on time. And we, we just like, we put in all those scores, it, it adjusted by the weighting that we put in and then we could rank them. And what we did after that was there were two different approaches that we took on separate years. So I was the, the, the deputy cadet commander one year and the cadet commander for another year. And we were instructed to do one process one year and one process the other year. The first approach that we took, the first, well, the first year that we were running it was that we just slotted everyone. So based off of what their first preference was, like the first person got their first preference. The second person got their preference and we just did it and we we slotted them into each spot and then after we were done slotting everyone we were like okay great and we sent out the emails to all the applicants saying hey congratulations you have been selected for this position please respond to this email letting us know that you want to do it and sign this cadet staff honor agreement and we will put you into that position officially in our spreadsheet okay and then the second process that we had was that we put them into groups and we did it so that we would send it to a chunk of people and we would say, hey, you have, you have the chance to pick any of these available positions still. And the reason why we did that was because some people may not necessarily say, hey, I want to apply for squadron commander. They might ap apply for flight commander instead of squadron commander. And they're just excelling in the process of like, directing people, delegating, and providing feedback, and they're one of the highest scores. That gives them the opportunity to adjust their mindset and say, oh, okay, so squadron commander is open now. I would like to serve in that position. 
So I think it, it depends honestly on how much time you have because that process took a lot of time for one of the um, operations, or not, well, the operations group commanders, one of my executive cadre members who I delegated to that too, she was like, this is taking way too much time and this, this person hasn't responded to the email and I'm sending out the next wave soon and it was just, it was a little bit chaotic. So just slotting people is easier but giving people the opportunity to say, oh, I scored high enough and I could actually do the position I originally wanted to do and I wasn't sure if I was good enough, sure, I'll do it. It, it's, it honestly depends on how much time you have as well. So let's, let's move on to the next part. So once people have been selected for serving on cadet staff, they are typically asked to serve in a position. They say, hey, yes, I'll do it. No, I won't do it and a spreadsheet is put together with like the organization of how everything is put together. At least that's what we did. And that way people could see who was in their chain of command and who they would be directly communicating with. Throughout the entire planning process, we made sure that we were doing weekly updates with my executive cadre. So each group commander was expected to send me an update of what their group had done over the last week what could use improvement like what was challenging to them if there was anything I could do to support them and if they had any questions and once all of those were filtered up we would have an, a nice little executive cadre meeting that once a week meeting to make sure that everyone was on the same page discuss email communications from the CDC or the, the Commandant of Cadets, it says that in 60-70, the Commandant of Cadets, or the Encampment Commander, or the uh, Support Deputy for Encampment, just to make sure that we understood what was going on. And upon finishing that meeting, there would be certain deliverables that would be expected from the groups, so like making sure that the cadet staff are putting together pocket classes that the flight commanders are actively mentoring their flight sergeants, that the first sergeants are also mentoring the flight sergeants and helping put together that PT plan while also providing updates to the squadron commander on how that PT plan is going. If they're on like the logistics team, then putting together a plan for logistics, dining services, putting together meal plans. All of that kind of information would be slowly delegated out. I personally did something as the cadet commander that I, I don't know if other wings have ever done it or if they continue to do it after, but I did something called the cadet training wing commander chats, where at one point throughout the planning process, probably about two months in, I had one-on-one -on -one discussions with each of the smaller teams. So I had, a, I had a discussion with like alpha flight staff and like the squadron three staff and just like the flight, or excuse me, the first sergeant and the squadron commander, um, just like those small teams to show them that I am listening, I'm here to support them, and I want to know what you guys have been working on. What are you proud of? Is there anything that has been really challenging you and you don't know how to approach? And that was actually really effective to find a few small holes. Like there was, there was one support team that needed some support because the senior member was just kind of ignoring them. They weren't communicating with the cadets and the cadets felt like they weren't doing anything. So they were like, I want to be involved with this, but I don't know how. We addressed that, they became more actively involved, and those those cadets excelled when it came to encampment itself. So make sure you advocate for yourself when you're on cadet staff, and if you have a challenge, or if there's a problem, just say something, communicate, and then we'll try to work together to come to some kind of consensus or solution. Sometimes we had some challenges with the pairings of cadet staff, like they didn't mesh well together. And even though when we were slotting them, we were like, hey, this person might work well with this person and they have this strength and we want to help support that person by mentoring them in that skill set. Um, in, in an event that that happened, we would try to work with the squadron commander or the group commander to try to mitigate that through some conflict management. Most of the time it worked. I think there was one or two occasions where it just, it felt a little icy but for the most part, it turned out pretty well. So if, if there's like, someone's not communicating, then just take note of that and maybe tell the, the superior. So if there's a flight sergeant who isn't getting emails from their flight commander, 
then that flight sergeant should definitely reach out to the squadron commander and the first sergeant saying, hey, I haven't heard anything from this person. I'm a little concerned because I, I want to know what's going on and I haven't heard anything. So please let me know what your thoughts are. Just making sure that there are transparent communications of expectations. That's really important. Earlier, I had mentioned something about honor agreements and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. I don't want this video to be too long, so I'm just, I'm going to talk about this and then I might make another part for this video, but we put together cadet staff agreements to show what our expectations are of the cadet staff. We wanted to make sure that the cadet staff understood what their responsibilities were, so we had one specifically for every position of the cadet staff. We wanted to make sure that they understood, like, who they would be talking to, who would be working with them, so kind of like who would be above them in like the chain of command and who they might be in charge of um, below them in the chain of command. And if they didn't follow the expectations that there might be repercussions for that, such as um, possibly counseling or readjustment of positions or removal from staff. There was one instance of this when I was a deputy where there was a there was a specific squadron commander who just would not communicate wouldn't send emails wouldn't actively like try to support the squadron they just didn't do what we were looking for and we we needed paperwork to be submitted to admin it was just a whole mess so we scheduled a meeting and we said hey we're concerned about this and here are the instances that we tried to reach out and we didn't hear anything back and we just wanted to make sure that if something is going on we we want to support you and the the reasoning that we were given was that they didn't have time to support the activity and that they wanted to put more time into it so they would try doing that um that individual we, we were like okay so as long as you meet our expectations over the next three weeks we will do our best to make sure that like we'll continue meeting those expectations and we'll check in with you they did not meet those expectations, and so they ended up just stepping down from that position, and we had someone fill in, which was a bit of a challenge, but we overcame it. So I'm just going to end the video here. We're going to have a part two to this, so if you have any thoughts on this video, please let me know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching, and that is all, folks. Until next time, toodles.